Okay, uh, we can continue the session uh, with the next uh, presentation. The next presentation will be handled by Dr. Jean-Francois Lai, who is a Chief Scientific Officer mm -hmm. in the Belgian company OncoDNA. Uh, he holds a PhD in molecular biology and has uh, considerable expertise with uh, next generation sequencing. So, uh, the title is Precision Medicine in Daily Routine Face Reality. Um, Good welcome, morning. welcome, and uh, I hand over to you. Okay, yes. thank, thank you, for you very much. And, uh, good morning, everybody. So I will share my screen. Can you see? You can see my slides. Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. So I will. Um, sorry. So I will uh, talk about uh, precision medicine and in daily routine and, and how to face reality between the dream and, uh, and, and what is going on in the routine. So, so first of all, what is precision medicine? So, you know, according to the Precision Medicine Initiative, the idea is really to, to identify the best treatment for, for the patient, taking into account uh, everything. So really, uh, you know, prevention, prognostic, predictive, and the idea at the end of the day is really to tailor a treatment based on the entire analysis of the patient. And if we go now uh, precision medicine in cancer, you know, at the early days, we were able to identify some variant in genes like ALK, EGFR, Keras, and others. And the idea was to uh, uh, provide the patient with a treatment based on those uh, biomarkers. Therefore, you see here, we started to identify a lot of variant genes biomarker where actually specific treatment were developed to really uh, target uh, those variant and improve patient's uh, care. So we had all the dreams where actually uh, the patient would be deeply uh, analyzed with molecular profiling, look at, looking at pathology, uh, sequencing, uh, expression of proteins, thanks to all those batteries of, uh, of biomarkers, we will be able really to identify different biomarkers and tailor a treatment based on this. And at the end of the day, uh, Cancer will be will be over, and that will be the death of the cancer. So the goal is to target the right patient for the right cancer at the right moment. But actually, reality is much more complicated than uh, you know the dream. First of all, uh, you have to deal with the quality of the samples and the quantity of the samples. So as you know, we have to work with a formalin fixed embedded uh, tissue, which are small. The quantity of material is limited. DNA is degraded and RNA is highly degraded. So even if you apply, you know, uh, strategies of next generation sequencing to identify different biomarkers, we know that in the best case, only 80% of the sample will be contributive, meaning that for 20% of the patient, the biopsy that has been taken will not be useful and we will not be able to uh, analyze uh, those biopsies. Another problem is that, okay, imagine that, uh, what about those biopsies that are not contributive? And you know, if you are thinking about the evolution of the disease, you know, the patient are not that willing to provide you with a biopsy every three months. Uh, so how to, how to make this profiling while you don't have any solid biopsies? So people were thinking about liquid biopsy uh, and especially to look at a uh, variant into ctDNA, so the, the DNA which is shed by the tumor cells. But then you have the question of what? what to look into ctDNA, which genes, when, 
You know, because the shedding of this ctDNA is highly dynamic and depends on different, uh, different features like the localization of the tumor, uh, the, 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 the evolution of the tumor, and why? Why to look at the ctDNA? Is it prognosis? Is it predictive? So there are still a lot of questions regarding uh, this uh, biopsy and how to look at it. Then, as you know, cancer is not something which is fixed. So cancer is uh, some kind of living animals, if I may say, and you will have the apparition, the dis disapparition of different clones that will contain different mutation and that will react differently to your treatment. So even if you apply a treatment at a certain time, you know that it's very uh, likely that the tumor will evolve and by Darwinian selection, you will generate clones that are resistant to your treatment. So you really need to find a way to monitor and adapt your treatment based on this evolution. Cancer is highly heterogeneous and cancer is evolving and we have to take this into account. Also, not all the cancer are equivalent. I mean, if you look at the repartition of the different variants based on the different cancer type, you know that some cancer type have more actionable, what is called actionable variant than others, and therefore those cancer will be more uh, suitable for uh, targeted therapies or specific therapies than, than the other. And even if a same biomarker is identified in a cancer A and a cancer B, the way to treat cancer A and B might be different because the impact of this variant is not the same according to the cancer type. So even if you have, you said, okay, I found this variant, I have a treatment against this variant in melanoma, it doesn't mean necessarily that if you are talking about a GIST or a lung cancer, that your treatment will be as efficient as it is in melanoma. You see here, it, it's even even more complex. It's really the, the efficacy of those treatments. So here you can see that according to the biomarkers and according to the, the cancer type, you have different prognosis and different response to the same treatment based on the same biomarker. So it's even what, again, this is what I mentioned. To identify biomarker is that is that sufficient. You really need to understand the complexity of the cancer and you really need to generate clinical evidence. Also, you know, when you have performed all those complex tests, you have this, you know, these great images that uh, a lot of people will take their time, one hour or two hours, discussing everything about the therapies, the, the conclusion, et cetera, et cetera. But actually the, the the truth, the, real, the, the reality is really different because very often the oncologists are overrun with data, they are overrun with work, and they have about 20 minutes to make their decision. So they really need uh, a really uh, a comprehensive report, uh, an educated information, as much comprehensive as possible in order them to make the decision in very fast turnaround time. Also, this is something that I'm facing every day because I'm a molecular biologist, I'm not an MD, is that actually biology and technology is evolving much more faster than the training of, of the MDs, the approval of the treatment, the clinical trial results, the reimbursement. So here, you know, we are pushing the technology, we are pushing the biology, unfortunately, uh, at the end of the day, we provide you with some information uh, that are not that useful because we are way ahead of what is allowed in your country to treat your patient. And it might in, introduce and induce some frustration because you have a biomarker, you have biological evidence, but the treatment is just not there, not approved, not reimbursed, or the test is not reimbursed. So we really need to much more coordinate our effort to make sure that at the end of the day, we are moving at the same speed. 
also, as you know, you know the, the patient journey is not a quiet road because thanks to internet, you know, they have access of a lot of information, good, bad information. And then there are a lot of questions that what biomarker are recommended for why, how the tests are performed, how often do I need a test because cancer is evolving, which test, when, what does those results mean? At the end of the day, for me, will I be better treated? Also, how those results will affect my treatment? Do I have to change the treatment, to adapt the treatment, to enforce the treatment, or to, to just to remove the treatment? You see, there are a lot of questions behind this, which is really complex uh, when you, ha you, you are facing a patient in front of you, uh, especially the patient that collect information on internet. This is not an easy job. And you know that at the moment there is a there is a shift you know in in the way the patient uh, is reacting to all this because before they were more passive they just rely on the information provided by by the physicians now they are looking in internet uh, they are changing oncologies they are more uh, willing to have more deep information etc so we, this is something which is more and more difficult to handle in, in reality. Uh, shall we talk about politics and economy, where actually, you know, the, we have to face, you know, the, what are the benefits for all the stakeholders, not only the patient, because at the end of the day, you know, the, the pharmaceutical companies are not selling the treatment for nothing. The CT scan has a cost. Every test has a cost. Who will pay what for what? And we have to take this into account if we really want uh, this precision medicine uh, moving within uh, the reality. And to do that, we have to demonstrate that the benefit is higher than the cost. And I'm not just talking about the benefit for the patient, which is obvious. We have to face economics because everything has a cost. And we really need to take this uh, very complex uh, ecosystem into consideration. So, as you, as you saw, you know, precision medicine is something really complex and needs to be, uh, and all the stakeholders have to work together to, to make this a reality. However, at the moment, there are already uh, some tools that might be used and that have shown benefit for the patient and cost effectiveness for, uh, let's say, the, the politics, I would call the politics. So we really have to take care and to consideration that not the concept type are equivalent. So we know that some patient, it's useless to give a treatment to a patient if the patient will not answer the treatment. Also, very interesting, you have no what they call pan cancer treatment, where actually a same variant will benefit in the same way for a common treatment. The difficulty is that those variants are really, really rare, meaning that only few patients will benefit, but the patient that have this variant will answer the treatment. So you need the cost effectiveness is huge, the point is that you have to convince the authorities to look at those variants at the early beginning in order not to waste your time and waste the money and, and, and put the patient into difficulty. Also, we, we, we really have to face the, the fact that complexity is increasing. Now, when I start, uh, it was chemotherapy. Now, you know, it's chemotherapy with targeted therapies. Then you have immunotherapy with chemotherapy targeted therapies. So complexity, um, you know, the, the, the combination of the treatment uh, is, is really huge and we have to face these difficulties. Also, in my opinion, precision medicine should be applied at the early beginning. Because, you know, very often I observe that precision medicine is applied after the fourth line, the fifth line, the sixth line, and even if we are able to identify something, very often the patient is not even 
able to bear the treatment because the patient is too weak. So I do believe that if we want to convince the politics, make precision a reality with a huge benefit for the patient, we have to perform this precision medicine at the initial diagnosis, or perhaps for some cancer type when the first line is, is failing and we need to react and find a solution for the patient. But if we are waiting too late, then there will be no benefit for anybody. So here it's a, a, a um, for instance, a, a, a product that we developed. So there are a lot of different products provided by different provider, but I prefer to talk about the one I developed. So the one I know the best It's really, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, a comprehensive uh, product in order to tackle the different genes slash variant phenotype that are associated with treatment, approved treatment or approved treat or a treatment in late clinical trial to uh, maximize, you know, with uh, just one small biopsy, all the biomarkers that we will be able to, to analyze. This is just some technical because we, we do rely, you know, we, we put our effort to reduce the quantity of DNA. We put our effort to increase the robustness facing the degradation of the, of the DNA. And we try to be as sensitive as possible uh, to make sure that we will not have false negative results. Also, um, as you know, a lot of um, people are thinking that NGS will solve everything. I mean, this is a, a great tool. This is amazing, but not everything is written in the DNA. You know, you have also the expression of some protein, you have the, some epigenetic phenomena, you have also, you know, tumor cells are not uh, working alone uh, uh, in, in the body. They are discussing with the immune system, they are discussing with uh, other cells. So, I mean, if you are just looking at the DNA, I'm pretty sure that you will miss a lot of things. And this is something we, we noticed a few years ago, we made a publication where we combined the benefit of the sequencing of the DNA only and the sequencing of the DNA with uh, the combination of uh, different tests, additional tests that we look, for instance, at the expression of some hormonal uh, receptor, some methylation of some promoter, etc. And we do observe that uh, if you just look at the DNA, uh, you will be able to detect something useful for the patient in 27% of the case. And this is not related with our test. This is just biology. If you add clever additional tests based on the cancer type, you can increase the benefit for the patient up to 92%. And the idea, of course, is to develop tests that can, that can tackle any kind of, of treatment. So targeted therapy, immunotherapies, chemotherapies. I will not talk about radiotherapies because our tests have, have not been suited for radiotherapies. Also, as I mentioned, uh, you have to provide this uh, with a very comprehensive report to make sure that the oncologist can understand everything and make his decision or her decision as fast as possible. Also, you need sometimes uh, an, uh, a PDF report because our, our reports are web-based reports. Because we also believe that it's very important that the oncologists have access to their report anytime, anywhere in the world. And actually, the COVID demonstrated the utility of having report available uh, through web uh, platform. But of course, you cannot be an expert in everything. Oncologists are experts in oncology. Radiologists are experts in radiology. You know, we are biologists and we are experts in biology. So I think that it's really important that we are all discussing together to make sure that everything is crystal clear and the decision that will be taken uh, by the oncologist will be the best uh, for the patient. Also, as I mentioned, what about when there is no solid biopsy? Actually, you can use liquid biopsy. So you need also to have a solution for liquid biopsy. But 
you need to know what you are looking at. Because either you are using liquid biopsy to tell the oncologist the tumor is, is back, but you don't know why it's just back. Or you can also combine this with the analysis of variants that are associated with resistance or sensitivity to other treatment, meaning that you will tell the oncologist, oh yes, the tumor is back, and I know there is a mutation in EGFR that explains why the tumor is back. So you have another treatment, etc., etc., etc. But the weak point with the liquid biopsy is that what about when you have no ctDNA or no variant identified in the blood? Because as you know, not all the tumors are shedding ctDNA depending on their evolution, depending on their biology, depending on lo localization. Meaning that when you have a negative results, you always have a doubt about, is it because the tumor shrunk or disappeared? Or is it because of biology? And the tumor is not shedding ctDNA. So one way to reduce this uncertainty, and this is what we develop, is to first you sequence the solid biopsy, you identify a bundle of about 15 variants that are specific from the tumor cells of the patient. And you look at those 15 uh, variants in the blood in addition to the biomarker associated with sensitivity or resistance. Then, by statistics, you are reducing the risk of false negative in a significant way, meaning that when you will tell, we will tell you we didn't identify ctDNA or the 15 specific variant in the blood, the likelihood of this is related to probably uh, uh, a response to the treatment is higher rather than just because of biology. So at the end of the day, precision medicine requires a solution made at diagnostic to not wasting material, not wasting time, a comprehensive and robust solution because decision should be taken uh, very fast and we have to face the quality of, uh, of the, the samples. We also need clinical-based evidence. No, it's not because uh, it's, uh, something has been discovered by biologists or something has been discovered in melanoma that it will work in non-small cell lung cancer. We need clinical evidence. You need a support for in interpretation. Cancer is complex. You need expert and you need expert that are talking together. And you also need a way to monitor the evolution of the tumor without any invasive uh, intervention. And liquid biopsy and ctDNA might be one of the solution. But I'm, if you look at the literature, there will be other because cancer is complex. So probably ctDNA will not be the holy grail. Perhaps we will have to combine this with exosomes, uh, methylation, I don't know but probably ctDNA is just part of the story. And of course, we need that all the stakeholders are involved in this process to make sure that at the end of the day, the dream we had that the cancer will disappear would be a reality. Thank you very much. And I would be happy if you have any, any questions. Thank you very much for the really very uh illuminating presentation. We touched the liquid biopsy in the previous discussion, and uh, I think we will get questions even later on through the chat, which we will share with all of you uh, as soon as possible. Uh, thank you very much also for uh, emphasizing that, yes, we had a huge progress in DNA sequencing, but that's not all the solution. As you mentioned, epigenetic, I would add, some uh, transcriptome uh, mutations uh, we can envisage. So, uh, I don't know if we have some questions from uh, the audience. So we have not yet. Not yet. We have some time to get questions. And uh, the, the solution you, uh, you provide uh, how it's, how it's being perceived by, by your uh, customers, uh, and especially because I'm a medical doctor, I would start first with the 
oncologists and healthcare professionals? Do they find it really suitable? Do they trust the, uh, the solution you mentioned and your company is um, delivering to your customers? Um, they have, n let's say, they have no doubt about the theoretical utility of such kind of solution. Because, I mean, the better you know your enemy, the better you will be able to, to defeat it. The difficulty very, that we are facing is uh, it's really the treatment that are available and reimbursed in the countries. Um, because, you know, the price of a test has a cost, I would not say the opposite, but compared to the price of the treatment, this is, this is not a lot. And when we are discussing, they agree that this is useful, they agree that, of course, this is not true for any cancer type, because there are some cancer types that uh, you don't have biomarkers. It's not true for any staging, you know, stage one and stage two. I mean, the treatment are working pretty well, actually. Uh, but when we are reaching to the, to the decision, very often they said, oh, yes, but what about if I have a mutation, the treatment is approved, according to ASCO AMA, but I cannot provide this treatment to my patient because either it's not approved or the patient will, depending on the country, I don't know what is the situation in your country, but in some countries, the patient will have to pay. Uh, this is where we are facing, uh, facing difficulties and we try to work, you know, uh, with, with uh, several people in such kind of countries to see, okay, to, to convince perhaps the pharmaceutical companies, because, okay, this is a market, huh? uh, to convince also the authorities that if they provide the treatment sooner for the patient, at the end of the day, there will be a benefit for the patient, but okay, they are more interested about the economics, there will be also an economical benefit for them or insurance. So this is the way we are working, and this is the way it's perceived by, by most of the oncologists. I fully agree. And what about if you do the test and then you see the mutation which can be treated by off-label use? So have you had any uh, case like that? Because I am aware of some projects uh, where artificial intelligence is used as well um, to faster uh, predict the driving mutation. and. It may well be the case where the mutation really we need to target is uh, not yet covered by approved medicine or let alone rainbows, as you mentioned. So we can offer clinical trial if trial is available. But uh, have you had in your practice uh, any, any a case where you you see that the best way to treat the patient may, may well be off-label. Oh, we, we observe that quite often, actually. But we are always careful in the sense that we need uh, that uh, there is a, a clinical trial somewhere or some clinical evidence that have been published uh, even for half-level treatment. So, for instance, if you have a BRAF mutation in thyroid, I will not advise you to treat with a BRAF inhibitor uh, because there is no clinical evidence that it will work. That's a wonderful example. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have one question from the audience as well, Dr. Le. Um, what is your opinion about the role of non-coding RNAs as biomarkers in cancer diagnosis and prognosis? <laughs> It's a huge, it's a huge topic, um, because non-coding RNA. It, it depends uh, if you are talking about uh, microRNA, for instance. If I, I take the, this example, um, it's complicated uh, because uh, you know the the good point with microRNA is that it's stable. The weak point of microRNA is that it's stable. So meaning that if you want to analyze the dynamic, it's it's pretty complex. My feeling is that any information which is associated with clinical bene benefit 
uh, clinical evidence will generate a benefit for the patient. So for the moment, microRNA, there are some things that are, are moving in the right direction, even some non-coding RNA. Uh, so perhaps, yes, it, it might be useful in, in the future. But uh, we have to be careful because a lot of expectation have been driven by non coding RNA, and so far, let's say that, uh, or oh, perhaps I didn't read the right article, but according to the article I read, this is not yet the case. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you very much, and very good luck in your uh, job, in your job uh, from now on. Uh, and thank you for the perfect timing. Uh, so please stay with us if you, if you can. Uh, we move to the next topic.